Mm, hi everybody, this is Christian from LazyDevs Academy, long time no see. So in the previous episode, I walked you through all of the steps I took in order to develop the you know, first three prototypes to finally figure out the gameplay of our shmup. Today I want to show you the feedback I received for those prototypes, how I reacted to that feedback, how I developed subsequent prototypes, and how I gradually you know, developed the final version of the gameplay. I began the entire phase of the prototyping like on the 26th of February 2024, that's the first video I recorded, so that's like over four months ago. Preparing the first three prototypes alone took like two months now, granted, I had like a surgery happening and all sorts of other things, so that prolong things. So when the first three prototypes were over, I thought, you know, I was over the hump. Little did I know. So let's go back in time and let's look at the first feedback I received for the first three prototypes. One month and 19 days ago. Okay, so I initially recorded vlog-like videos that would document my progress during the different rounds of feedback. But when I edited it all together, I ended up having a, like a two-hour video. It's, it's just really a lot. So for the sake of time, I will do a scripted summary. And I will make the vlogs available for coffee supporters. If you want to see all of it, I will talk about how to become a supporter at the end of the video. Okay, so just to remind you where I was at this point, I had three prototypes. Prototype A was a pretty vanilla shmup with a cave-style focus fire and a simple bomb. Prototype B had a simpler shot and a dedicated bomb button, but it focused a lot on chaining pickups for scoring. Prototype C had a weird scoring system partially inspired by Balatro, where you would build up a base score as you charge your rocket ability, and then that would get multiplied by triggering the rockets and killing enemies with them. The feedback on the first round went pretty much as expected. Prototype A was okay, but kinda boring, needed something spicy. I was surprised to hear that an experienced shmup player like Actane didn't really jive with the cave style controls. It looked like continuous tapping is tiresome for everybody. I can't disagree. I got good feedback on Prototype B from Loki Striker, but at this point I had already realized that I don't like it that much myself. I'm not a big fan of chaining. Prototype C had everybody intrigued. It was difficult to wrap your head around it, and the systems were perhaps poorly communicated, but there was something there. Big brain scoring. Also people liked the controls. A dedicated shoot button and a dedicated focus fire button. It was very clear. Bombing was a bit tricky. It would work by letting go of all of the buttons. I also got a ton of small notes on how to hone the shmup overall. One thing that met a lot of resistance were the RNG pickups. In all of my prototypes there would be sometimes situations where the pickups would drop based on RNG. In some situations sometimes you would get a pickup and sometimes not. This was universally disliked. And I already kind of anticipated it. I think I had a good case for why they still made sense in this specific scenario and that would have been a really fun thing to discuss, but really it didn't matter. If I had to explain explain why something is fun, I already lost. And I wasn't that married to the idea anyway, it was just worth a try. One piece of feedback I got from Actane that gave me pause had to do with the bombs in Prototype A. He pointed out how I would reward players for doing risky close range kills by charging the bomb meter faster. This means that less experienced or less bold players would get bombs less frequently. But less experienced players maybe needed the bombs more than the more experienced players. So I gave the bombs to the wrong people. I needed to rethink the reward structure here. Also, people really liked the rockets from Prototype C. The only feedback was that they just felt they weren't as useful as they could be. One thing Actane suggested was making the rockets cancel bullets. But at this point, the rockets were already becoming a huge time sink and a huge token sink, and I was already considering getting rid of them altogether. Eight days later. It is kind of surprising. It took me eight days to cobble together the next round of prototypes. It sure didn't feel that way. I decided to commit to the controls from Prototype C on all of the subsequent prototypes. So there would be a dedicated shoot button, a dedicated focus fire button, and all of the bombs would involve some kind of meter and letting go of the buttons. I abandoned the missiles, I lost faith that I can make them work within a reasonable token limit and time frame. As a replacement, I came up with a new bomb effect that looked like a big explosion in the anime Akira, and this one felt good immediately. I also reworked the way the cow pickups spawned. When I turned off the RNG to make it so that they always spawn, I was worried that players would get too many cows from the popcorn enemies, so I implemented a system that would group enemies into formations. You would only get a cow from shooting down an entire formation. 
for Project D, I wanted to give it another shot with something simple. You would collect cows as a resource. You could then spend the cows to trigger a hypermeter. This was vaguely inspired by Espagaluda 2, where you would also collect gems to spend them in a special mode. Then I came up with a weird control for triggering the hyper. So hear me out. You would need to press and hold the focus fire button without shooting. It was a way to cram additional functionality into the two buttons we had. In addition, there was also a meter. When the meter was full, you could trigger a bomb by letting go of the shoot button. If you managed to bomb while in hyper mode, you get a stronger bomb and this was a way to get a lot of points. The next prototype, Prototype E, started somewhere else entirely but ended up being in a similar place. I was getting inspiration from the solo board game Super Skill Pinball 4 Kate. I came up with a system that had two effects that would be hard to sync up. So there would be a bomb meter like before, but now collecting cows would also automatically trigger a hyper mode at a certain point. If you could arrange to bomb in hyper mode, the multipliers would stack. But the trick was that the threshold for when the hyper mode triggers would be different every time. So players would need to work out a way to sync up the two. The final prototype, Prototype F, was a continuation of the Balatro idea. I made big numbers appear to communicate clearly what the multiplier was. I replaced the rockets with a bomb and I simplified the system to increase the bolt only by cancelling enemy bullets with the bomb. The bullets would get sucked into the ship when you use the bomb. And the cows, the cows were, were just, just giving a flat score. I wasn't sure what to do with the cows. 14 days later. Feedback on the second round of prototypes took a while because everybody was busy with the bullet hell game jam. By the time I got the feedback, I went on a trip and that delayed things even further. Generally, prototypes D and E didn't work at all like expected. Nobody really understood how to trigger hyper mode in prototype D. It was awkward. You need to like stop shooting, push a special button, hold it, then it triggers. But then you can't really tell that you triggered hyper mode because you aren't shooting. It had bad discoverability and even if you knew what you were doing, it felt clunky. That overshadowed any other feedback I got from Prototype D and you know what, fair enough. Prototype E felt smoother, but the shifting hyper threshold didn't play out as planned. Players weren't really interested in syncing up the bomb with the hypers that much. They haven't been given really good tools to do that. Instead, all they wanted to do is to get to the latter hypers as fast as possible, because those would have higher mults. So the system kind of rewarded getting a hyper and then intentionally letting it run out as soon as possible. This was unfortunate because I also noticed that starting a hyper and then collecting more pickups during the hyper to extend its duration was actually actually pretty fun. Bummer. Prototype F, the Balatro one, continued being the winner, but somehow my changes didn't really clarify all that much. The bomb was distracting and players wouldn't notice that the bullets would get sucked into the ship. Nonetheless, especially since the other two prototypes misfired, this continued to be the favorite. As Actane put it so nicely, this felt the most like he was playing the game I intended. Despite this, there was still a fundamental issue that didn't sit well with him and with me for that matter. This prototype was the most prescriptive, telling players straight up when it was time to bomb, I would need to look for ways to loosen up the system. I made a ton of more notes on things that would give me pause. Especially prototypes E and F start to exhibit this strange dynamic. They created those situations where it would be beneficial for scoring to let the screen fill up with enemies to get more hits with a bomb. But that was impossible to do because you had to keep the fire button pressed to keep the bomb charged. The game didn't offer tools to resolve this awkward situation. It was also hard to kill the big enemies with a bomb because they had more health than the bomb was doing damage. So testers asked to increase the bomb damage or to give some kind of indicator when the big enemies were damaged enough to be finished off by the bomb. Something I really appreciated was to see Actane bring this scoring-focused perspective to his playtesting, where he would deliberately try to demonstrate broken strategies. Maybe not all of his approaches were actually that viable in the end, but it was valuable to see my assumptions being challenged that way, and his points were always well taken. I also received some really comprehensive high-level feedback from Boghawk this time. It was good to hear from somebody with a very different perspective because he pointed out things I haven't heard from others. Among other things, he pointed out how I created systems that were in conflict with each other but that didn't offer inherent conflicts. So it might be tricky to sync up the hyper with something else, but once you got into hyper, nothing exciting happened. 
He also pointed out how all of my bombs hit every enemy on the screen. This means it didn't really matter where you would trigger them, making the bombs limited in range would perhaps add more depth. Same for the magnetic effect sucking in all of the pickups, it was so easy to pick up the pickups, it was basically automatic. It didn't really matter what the players did. He also questioned whether I really needed the focus fire. The level I had didn't really require it, and Actane brainstormed ideas for alternate control schemes at one point as well. This made me wonder whether I maybe committed too early to that specific control scheme. One final note I took from this feedback round that nobody really said out loud but that I noticed myself had to do with the pickups. I noticed how all of the prototypes used the same pickup system. Enemies would drop cows when killed. That's it. So whatever benefit you got from picking up the cows, you could also just as well have gotten from killing the enemy in the first place. The pickups were just like this pointless detour, and the magnetic effect made things even worse. I really needed to rethink the pickups. 20 days later. Round 3 of prototypes took a while to develop. I felt like because prototypes D and E were such duds, I really needed to step up my game. I wanted prototypes that were all different and all viable in this round. And I also wanted people to play the game I actually designed. So I reworked the bomb effect once more to allow for ranged bombs. This required tweaking the Akira bomb so it starts with like a dark shadow on the ground. Also the way the bomb faded out was different to communicate that it was not hitting all of the enemies on the screen. Basically built this again from scratch to make it work. I reworked the pickups. Something I had avoided until now was making the pickups appear on close kills. This is because at close range the pickups would get immediately sucked in by magnetic force. You would hardly even see them. So I set up systems to eject pickups far away from exploding enemies. I basically removed the magnetic force as well. I also added functions to spawn multiple pickups at once. All this had this nice side effect of making explosions look really nice. The pickups looked like debris and increased a sense of the bomb being a force that acts on the environment. For the awkward focus only button press, I came up with a new mechanic. I called it shield, basically holding it would charge the bomb faster and slow down nearby bullets. This would allow players to stop shooting while holding a bomb charge to let the screen fill up. The slowdown also opened new strategic opportunities. And if players would miss this mechanic, it wouldn't be that big of a deal because it wasn't that important. This was basically meant as an additional tool for scoring. Finally, for the big enemies, I added new visual effect. The enemies would flash and burn when their HP was low enough to be killed by the bomb. This was useful for gameplay, but also it was a nice effect that I always liked to see in shmups. I started this round with the last prototype, the prototype I, the Bellatro prototype. I changed things around, so now the bomb would turn nearby bullets into stars, and those stars would burst out of explosions like from a piñata. I also made that abstract Balatro system more clear and straightforward. I would just show how much a star pickup is worth. That number would go up by killing enemies. Once you trigger a bomb, you would get that many points every time you pick up a star. This is still functionally the same system, it just avoids having to flash, you know, mathematical calculations with a base value and a mult. You would know how much of a mult you got by just looking at how much stars you collected. The new shield ability was a good fit for the system because slowing down the bullets made it easier to generate more stars. I also came up with an idea for the cows. So now cows would spawn when you killed enemies with a bomb and they wouldn't give you a score, they would just level up the next bomb. And the idea was that higher level bombs would be bigger and also you could hold their charge for longer. Overall, I had a good feeling on this one. This line of prototypes had been successful until now and it seemed like the changes addressed a lot of the remaining issues. So I continued work on prototype G. For prototype G, I still wanted to make a simple, straightforward version with just the right amount of spice. So I started working on the pickups. Killing enemies at close range would spawn an energy cube pickup. These would charge a hypermeter and once the meter was full, a hyper would trigger automatically. While in hyper mode, enemies would spawn a lot of cows. Picking them up would give you points and prolong the hyper. The value of the cow pickups would rise as you pick up more cows, so it was desirable to keep the hyper going as long as possible. I called the system the cow frenzy. In addition, there was the usual charge bomb. Killing enemies with a bomb would spawn a lot of pickups and this would make it easier to get into hyper mode or stay in hyper mode. By the time I got to prototype 
age, I was kind of running out of ideas. I knew I wanted to test an alternate control scheme, so I started with that. I removed the focus fire. Instead, tapping the second button would trigger the bomb. Holding it would start hyper mode. I wasn't sure what to do for scoring, and I wanted to have something different from the other two prototypes, so I kinda shamelessly stole ideas from a different game. The shmup Devil Blade just came out, and I basically adapted some of the systems from that game. Killing enemies at close range would give you more points. This came in three tiers, 2x, 3x and 4x, depending on how close you got. Hyper mode gave you a 5x on top of that, so killing an enemy at extremely close range in hyper mode gave you a whopping 20 times the base score. Unlike in Devil Blade, Bomb and Hyper was governed by a common meter vaguely similar to Crimson Clover. You could charge a meter by picking up cows or just hitting enemies. Once it was halfway charged up, you could choose to spend it on a Bomb or spend it on Hyper. But you could also wait and charge it even more to get an even longer Hyper or to be able to Bomb during Hyper, for example. This opened up quite a few strategic options. While testing, I noticed that bombing in Hyper was kind of fun, especially since I turned up the range of the bomb in Hyper. So I added an additional wrinkle when it was basically always possible to bomb while in Hyper mode, even if you didn't have the meter. You could basically end Hyper mode with one last bomb that could give you the pickups to set up for the next Hyper. As a final touch, I changed the shot type in hyper mode. I made the shot straight instead of spread out to balance out the fact that there was no focus fire. I also generally wanted hyper to feel just more different than normal mode. All in all, this round of prototypes felt quite mature. All three prototypes felt viable, but they were very different from each other. So I went into the next feedback round with a good feeling. One day later. The feedback on the third round of prototypes was hard to stomach. There is this funny dynamic happening here. Early prototyping is scary, you feel aimless. So any feedback you get, even if it's negative, feels good. It gives you direction. Late in the prototyping cycle, you think you know where you're going, so negative feedback feels more like a setback. Also, having multiple viable prototypes means that you need to abandon some of your babies. Feedback for Prototype G was generally unclear. There is a well-known phenomenon when doing user testing where testers will always obsess about the most obvious problems for going to discuss the rest of the experience. I feel this is a little bit what happened here. The talk was all about the weird shield ability. Yes, it was misplaced here and yes, it was awkward and confusing, but I got very little useful feedback on the rest of the prototype. Perhaps that meant it wasn't exciting enough? Hard to tell. Feedback for prototype I was downright painful. The bilateral line of prototypes has been the most successful until now, and I felt I had cleared up all of the lingering issues. But the prototype did not resonate with the testers. Once again, I think the shield ability was partially to blame, although it felt more useful here. But also a real deal breaker were the stars. They were difficult to pick up. Quite often you would only manage to catch a paltry few. This felt punishing and stingy. I had also thought introducing a way to upgrade the bombs by picking up the cows would add strategic depth and give more space within the otherwise rigid system. In reality it was just confusing. Players wouldn't know what pickups to go for and in order for the bombs to feel tangibly bigger they had to start out small and underwhelming. Overall the prototype asked too many questions and gave no clear and satisfying payoffs. The real winner was prototype H, the devil blade like, and despite getting glowing feedback for it, it still felt like a hollow success somehow. The prototype removed the focus fire, a feature that looked good and felt good, a feature that I liked, and the playtesters kind of missed it too despite loving the prototype. And for some weird irrational reason, the fact that some of the systems were inspired by Devil Blade felt cheap somehow, like as if I was doing plagiarism. Funny enough, somehow I had no such issues lifting ideas from Balatro. Go figure. Some notes I got circled around questions how to deal with a bombing out of hyper. Should every hyper end with an automatic bomb or should players need to anticipate the right moment like an active reload in Gears of War? Also the flat 5x multiplier from Devil Blade was boring. And also the bomb range felt a bit small, especially if the regular bomb was made for survival. There seemed to be no point to use the bomb because going hyper gave you a bomb anyway and it was even a bigger one. 
There was also a bit of discussion on the straight shot in hyper mode, it felt a bit arbitrary, and on closer inspection it didn't even have that much of an effect. The bullets all originate at the options, which are pretty far away from the ship, so when fighting big enemies it didn't really matter if the shots were straight or spread, you would only be able to hit the enemies with three of the four streams anyway. Eight days later. The fourth round of prototypes went surprisingly fast. There was no need to reinvent any systems, I had to just recombine and hone existing elements. Prototype J was following an idea that Actane spitballed on the stream, filling out some of the gaps as I went. Basically the idea was to combine the Balatro scoring with the Devil Blade prototype. During Hyper, players would increase the value of star pickups by killing enemies. You would end the Hyper with a bomb, which would then turn enemies and bullets into stars. Additionally, stars would also spawn during Hyper. That last bit I wasn't so sure about. The very first Balatro prototype, Prototype C, had pickups that increased the multiplayer as well, and back then the feedback was that it was confusing, it muddled the waters. Also, I didn't like how the stars would spawn while the value was still increasing. Actane had initially suggested to do like a big tally at the end of Hyper, but I wanted to avoid showing long mathematical calculations on the screen. Nobody had the time to parse those. But spawning stars of constantly changing values was a bit messy, an early star would be worth almost nothing and a late star would be crazy valuable. Would that be maybe too confusing? I tweaked the controls, prioritizing hyper. Tapping the button once would start hyper. Tapping the button in hyper would bump out of hyper. Double tap would trigger a powerful survival bomb without going into hyper. I also insisted on forcing players to bomb out of Hyper for this prototype. I figured they would be getting stars during Hyper anyway, so missing the bomb trigger at the end of Hyper wouldn't be as devastating. I added a flashing effect to help communicate when Hyper was about to run out. I also moved the meter to the top of the screen where it was more easily visible. Because of the discussion of the spread shot, I reverted all of the shots to just like the standard spread shot for this prototype. Now prototype K was a variation of the same idea, I just tweaked some elements to see how they play out. The most important change was how the stars spawned. In this prototype the stars only spawned on the bomb at the end of Hyper. There would be no stars during Hyper. To help with that I added an auto bomb at the end of Hyper. Otherwise you could easily lose out on all of the score that you accumulated during Hyper. That would be overly punishing. I also doubled down on a focus fire on Hyper this time around. I made the options narrower and I made them spin like in a regular focus fire. This resulted in a narrow power Powerful shot that would obliterate even the bigger enemies, but shooting down smaller popcorn enemies required a lot more mobility. In order to help with that, I slightly increased the movement speed. My hope was that it would make the hyper mode feel different, that it would require a different play style from the players. The final prototype, prototype L, was a departure. I wanted to see if there was maybe a way to bring back focus fire. So I added a cave style focus fire controls like in prototype A. Tap the button for a spread shot and hold the button for focus fire. This was more demanding on the players, so I went with a simpler hyper scoring system. Instead of the whole Bellatro thing, I brought back the cow frenzy from prototype G. But now instead of cows, it would be stars. Going hyper would spawn a whole bunch of stars and you would get more score the more of them you would pick up, basically making big number go as big as you can. Overall, this last round didn't really feel like a proper round, especially compared to the previous one. I really just moved things around a bit. The first two prototypes were really similar, but the feedback on prototype H was already very positive. And as I brought in all of the ideas from the other prototypes, I could already tell that the puzzle pieces were starting to fall into place. We were getting there. One day later. And we are done, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, yesterday I received some feedback round from, from Actane and we will always post the, all the streams that we did with Actane down at doobly-doo. I also received feedback from other people. Loki Strike, I played it a lot. I also got some feedback from some friends of mine. And it seems like, it seems like we arrive at the, finally, at the position where we want to be. We have prototypes that people just thoroughly enjoy and feel like this is now the game. There's still some questions, some lingering small questions, but I am not interested in solving those questions now in the prototyping phase. The broad, the big questions, the direction has been answered. Yes. Broadly speaking, uh, prototypes J and K have been the, the most successful ones and they're very similar. Most people gravitate towards prototype J, which is a more generous prototype with a lot of stars appearing, a lot of scoring, and broadly speaking, simpler shots. 
uh, Project K is a little bit more, uh, asks a little bit more skill. Um, the shot is narrow and hyper, so you have to move more. And um, the stars only appear at certain moments, so you really have to time your bombing. So yeah, these are things that we kind of have to figure out maybe later on. Um, but that's not a major question, right? Like this is still something we can very easily tweak and it doesn't change the uh, gameplay of the game massively. Um, one other feedback I also received that I also want to keep in, in the back of my head is kind of like, uh, we need to clarify maybe a little bit the feedback, the indicators, um, like there might should be an indicator, there is an indicator already that indicates whether uh, the hyper is about to run out. When you're in the hyper, when you're at the end of the hyper, the ship blinks and that's a little bit like, there's just a lot happening on the screen. It's very easy to miss that. So maybe we need a more a clearer indicator. Also maybe like some kind of indicator for, because the stars are becoming more valuable in the hyper. So maybe they should change color, or become golden star. Like first there's silver, maybe then golden, you know, just, or become bigger in general. Um, there's different ways we, we can solve this. I'm not that, um, worried about making these things work. These are something that we can figure out or we can leave them out and it will still work fine. Now this has been a tremendously long episode. I spent a long time on this prototyping. So I want to wrap up with giving some thoughts, some insights of this process. What did I learn in the last couple of months? So one thing that you might be wondering is why I always insisted on creating three prototypes. Uh, you might think that this entire process would have gone so much faster if I only only made one prototype. And the reason for that is that's something that I experienced from previous uh, projects. Generally, whenever you show something to people and you wanna get feedback on it, it's a tremendously good idea to show them multiple versions, to show them things that they compare things to. Because if you just show them one thing, they will never say something bad about it. They, or they will struggle formulating like a, like a criticism of it because there's nothing to compare it to. But not just that. The fact that you force yourself to create multiple variations of an idea or of a game or something gives you the leeway to be more experimental in the way you approach things. You can always say like, hmm, should I do this like this or like this? Let's make it just two different prototypes and let's see which one works out. You, can, you are free to pursue different uh, avenues. You are not so much focused on making you know, the one thing, right? You are allowed to be more free to experiment more. And I think this is very important for creativity. Quite often creativity dies when you are really stressed and you feel like you have to deliver the one idea, right? And inevitably something that happens is like, you know, uh, ideas from one prototype have to be merged with ideas from another prototype, but that's fine, that's maybe okay. In fact, that's actually what happened in the final round. We kind of merged, you know, the Bellatro thing that we've been working all this time with another idea that popped up at some point. Now, one of the reasons why this take took such a long time is you saw that there were a lot of dead ends. Like this process, this method, results in you working on a lot of things that are very slow to develop because you're not really sure where you're going. And if you're not sure where you're going, the programming takes a lot of time, the development takes a lot of time, things are a lot faster when you know exactly where you're going, right? And you have to create more of it because you have three prototypes, right? So you end up working on those little projects, little side projects, little rabbit holes that um, often end up being dead ends. It's a very ineffective way of doing programming. And I have to admit, I'm a bit of a stickler when it comes to making things visually polished. I think I might have achieved the same results, but being a bit more loose with somewhat visuals, but this is really just the way I work. I'm really motivated by visual effects and I think visual effects are also very important for the genre that I'm working in. So that's kind of like part of the occupational hazard on working on games, on working on these kinds of prototypes. You end up working on systems, on effects that are very time intensive, that never make it in a real game. Uh, I have like, I don't know, like four different types of bombs and I can only keep one. So if you end up in the same situation yourself, don't worry, this is normal. This is the way things play out in my experience. Now there's something that I noticed that is kind of interesting that I, I was aware of, but it was interesting to see this and that um, setting up this prototyping thing, like creating like a level that I can test things on was really good, but every kind of prototyping setup has some limitations. There's some things that you just don't test, right? In my case, I set up this level to test different prototypes and it was great, but also replaying the level over and over again gave me an appreciation for how level design and shmups generally work. I understood now what are the problems with the level, little level I designed here. There is like a weird 
you know, dead air gap at the round, at the cliff where the hit cliff happens. And, you know, me replaying, having to replay that level over and over again with different mechanics just made me aware that, oh, this is a problem. But quite often I also received feedback that I had to put like into the folder of, okay, this is something I have to think about later when I do level design. This is not something about the thing that I'm trying to figure out right now. So for example, Barkhawk actually mentioned something to me that, that gave me a pause where he said like, okay, you have focus fire in your game, but you don't have situations in the level that were that require focus fire. It's not really necessary for the kind of level that you created. So I was like, oh, wow, right, sure. So in order to create, to test focus fire, I would have to create a level that also creates a situation where focus fire is useful. But that was for me kind of out of the question. I didn't want to start doing level design uh, because it also will remove like the comparability between the prototypes and would be also technically kind of advanced. I wouldn't didn't want to open this new can of worms. So that's where I became aware that my prototype prototyping setup has a blind spot. I might not be getting accurate readings of how the game mechanics play out because the game mechanics always happen in context, in relationship with a level design. And I'm not iterating on the level design, I'm just working on the game mechanics. And not all of the game mechanics fit to the one test level that I created, right? So that was interesting. Now, I think if there is like a major takeaway, a major insight that I got from this prototyping phase, the major lesson that I learned here is to pay attention to, you know, Mm, the balance between testing skills and being generous to players. The balance between asking something from players and giving them something. It's a very subtle balance. It is very easy to upend the balance. A lot of your instincts about how this balance works out are very skewed because you are not aware of the other side. And also this balance is very context dependent. A lot of the conversation around shmups and arcade games is all about, you know, oh, we need to test the players. I mean, there is, it's all about skill, skill play, showing off skill play, very much about difficulty. You need to vamp up difficulty, add richness to the gameplay, you know? So it seems like you need to increase the ask side. The ask side is that where you need to get, invest you know, a lot of effort. You need to challenge players. But what I found is that whenever I invested a lot of things in the ask side, in the ask side of things, I ended up having received very negative feedback. Players would get overwhelmed or players wouldn't understand what is happening or they would feel like I'm being, you know, the fun police, basically, or the flow of the game would be disturbed. They have to suddenly, you know, the, the, the game elements would be in tension against each other. So, for example, I had this, the star pickups in one of the prototypes and the start pickups would fly away. So there was a challenge, there was, a, there, was a, there was an ask for the players to, you know, develop skills now to collect all the pickups so they get more score. But in this specific context, that felt stingy and punishing. Uh, this wasn't a moment to be asking even more of the players. This was the moment to give to the players. This was the moment to balance this equation because they already gave you enough to get to this point. So this was the moment to give something back to them. Another thing that also uh, skews this equation is something like time, the context in which the game takes place. Something I'm more used to is designing uh, slow paced games like strategy games or board games. In these kinds of games, it's very common to create like those, you know, those dilemmas, you know, where you have, because you have to time to, in, to invest and to, to simmer in the dilemma, you know, it's like, should I do this or should I do this? That's good game design for those games because you are free to really explore the questions that you're asking to the players and it's fun to explore those questions. So for example, one of the inspirations, I haven't actually mentioned this, but one of the inspirations for one of the prototypes was this game here that is called, um, oh, it's, it's a German version, it's called Flipper Mania. The English name is uh, Super Skill Pinball 4K. It is a solo board game that replicates uh, the experience of playing pinball. And it has a lot of interesting scoring mechanics. So I was like, I was playing this game a lot to kind of like get ideas for how scoring mechanics could work out. The problem is that a lot of the scoring mechanics in this kind of game just don't translate well into like an action game where things are happening rapidly. Even though the scoring mechanics feel like as if they are from kind of like an arcade, from a kind of like a pinball kind of machine, uh, in reality, these are way more straightforward in an actual arcade in an actual pinball machine. Because in an action game, you don't have the time to consider the question, to consider the repercussions of your decision, to weigh the different pros and contrasts against each other. You are shooting things and you have split second decisions. And it is way more important to give player a clear direction than to ask 
interesting, complicated questions. Now, I wanted to wrap up with some of the insights into you know, the emotional aspect of going through these prototypes, how I felt, how it felt going through this process, creating weeks and weeks of prototypes, because this is very important to me. I don't think we're, uh, in the games industry we are talking enough about you know, the emotional impact, the emotional challenges of creating games. So one of the things that hit me a lot <laughs> during this phase, and that's as normal, I expected that, but I still felt it, like you cannot get away from that, is a huge amount of imposter syndrome. You know, I'm being like this educator here in front in YouTube, I'm telling you how to make these games. I made all these videos interviewing shmup developers and breaking down shmup concepts. I felt like I, I presented myself as a shmup expert. So then being put in a situation where you create shmup prototypes and they are are not great and they make you know very basic mistakes that oof that triggered a lot of imposter syndrome it felt like i should be able to nail this immediately and not being able to nail this and making rookie mistakes felt incredibly bad <laughs> one of the issues here is that knowing about certain things and you know having knowledge of of concepts of rules of thumb of game design ideas doesn't necessarily translate into creating games that follow these things because you know so many things and it's hard to tell how to condense all of those ideas and, and, and concepts in your head into a practical prototype. It, because it's not just like about, you know, do this, do that, but also striking a balance and finding that balance is not something that, you know, that knowledge about the theory solves for you. That's something that you need to figure out by doing, by doing bad prototypes. <laughs> It's one of those things where you make obvious mistakes, but those obvious mistakes are only really you know, obvious in hindsight. They're not really obvious when you're making something, right? Now, at least I had the experience of, you know, I knew I went through this process multiple times already. I knew that eventually, you know, you get through and it will be fine. Uh, but if you are going through this process for the first time, it's normal. Don't stress out. Just be patient. It's all part of the process. You will get there eventually. And because this process uh, is so painful, so emotionally challenging, there is always something that I, that is kind of hard to resist, and that is this urge to just call it finished immediately, right? So at any given point in the previous rounds, I could have picked just the most successful prototype and say, that's it, you know? Like, people liked some of the prototypes, right, uh, previously. And I was like, it's very tempting to say, like, just, just make it end, just like take the thing that the people like the most from this round and just call it a day. And sure, it's not perfect, but what is, you know? And my advice, is to resist that instinct, that urge, you know, to just like pick something and then and, and work with that instead of going back to the drawing board and trying out more things until you know that something works well. You have to know when it's something that is finished, right? But also that entire process, that prototyping process is also a way to discover like what was the impulse that drove you to a project or what is the impulse that could be the thing that is driving the project. In this case, I had like these vague notions of um, I already talked about in previous videos that I really wanted to have all of the abilities to kind of like make a circle, make a be something that you constantly use rather than being like these kind of like side things, you know? Something that always bugged me, for example, is that uh, in a lot of games, a lot of shmups, the bombs are something that you, there's like mixed messaging with that. You, you're supposed to use them, but you get more points if you don't use them. So it's like always like, is that a cheap way out? Is that something for newbies to get through a difficult section? Or is that something that you actually, like even an experienced player should use? There's a bit of a mixed messaging that's always bugged me. So in throughout this project, I noticed, I realized that this is actually something that could be the driving force here. That's something that uh, a design principle that I want to challenge or ask. How can I design a game where bombing becomes part of the process? That was there from the very beginning. But uh, throughout the different versions of different prototypes, I find myself more and more exploring this question and, and finding different answers to this question, how to make bombing an integral part of um, the game loop, so to speak. And especially at the end, in the, in the last rounds, I found myself being able to answer this question better and better. And I found it very interesting when the design process, when you realize that the design process is not so much, not just about uh, answering practical questions, how does the game work, but also answering kind of like philosophical questions. What is my stance? What I'm trying to convey in this game? Anyway, it's finally time to wrap up this episode and move on to the part of the end of each video where I say a big thank you and huge shout out to all of the people who have been supporting 
supporting this show, especially in these difficult times throughout this entire process where I haven't been posting any videos to my channel because I've been slaving away at those prototypes. Thank you so much for your support. And a huge shout out to new people who joined the coffee crew. This includes new supporters Farley, XL12 and one of donations by Judge Graves, Sturk, Daimos, OG OG, Amerigo, Alex, Dario, Manuel, Cohen, Zalma, Matthew, Lister. And finally, a huge shout out and big thank you to Will Brown, who has supported me with a very, very generous donation. Thank you so much, Will. This was a gigantic undertaking and I'm incredibly relieved that this came to an end. I'm eager to jump in and go back to where my actual game is at and walk you through all of the process of getting this dirty and, and trashy prototype and recreating all of those effects and all of those features in a more controlled and clean fashion. I hope you will tune in next time. Bye bye guys.